For months, we no longer slept because of the noise. We would leave the house and see only bloodshed and dead bodies. One day, the violence reached our very streets. We lost my dad. That's the day we decided we could no longer stay. These are the words that a Syrian child said to me. Now, how might we help this child? We might begin by giving them protection, education, respect, security, and love. Imagine now having to provide these things for over 13 million other children in the same position. 13 million. Now, on top of that, imagine that these children and their families are shrouded with discrimination. Refugee, refugee, refugee. So much so that their names, their identities are secondary to refugee. They know they are unwanted. They know because others let them know. This is a challenge that faces the world. The world has never been exposed to the same levels of movement as it has today. The UNHCR estimates that 31 people are forcibly displaced every single minute. Refugee situations now last 26 years on average. And as borders and policies grow more restrictive, over 84% of refugees are left to reside in developing regions and in some of the world's poorest countries. These regions, like Africa and the Middle East, are left to survive the pressures of providing refuge and safety for millions of individuals. As a result, poverty, soaring levels of unemployment, and dividing social tensions continue to shape the lives of both citizens and refugees. Our response to refugee crises has often been passive. As we leave these nations to deal with the pressures of providing for refugees, segregation and discrimination have become common experiences for refugees. Today, I want to focus on one very important issue, how children's lives are being shaped by the systems we've allowed to exist, and why our passive perspective and our solutions can no longer be sustainable. I have spent the last four years looking at how countries in the Middle East have responded to the refugee crisis in Syria. Millions of Sy Syrian children are in need of education in these countries. Countries like Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan have tried to address the needs of children, and different educational initiatives have been implemented. I look at one of the most intriguing approaches called the double shift system. In this system, the day schooling hours are separated so that in the morning, host, host nation's children attend schools independently of Syrian children who attend in the afternoon. This widespread system is viewed as a way to integrate refugees into these countries' official curricula. And yet, the majority of Syrians attend schools where they are separated from all other communities. It's a solution that has been used in very limited resources and in the hope that one day refugees would return home to their country. I look at one of the most challenging contexts. It's a pressing context where hundreds of thousands of refugees have been hosted in Jordan. Despite the country's struggle to meet the demands of its own citizens, seven years later, children in this country continue to learn in spaces that deny their right to be belong elsewhere. This situation is not unique to the Middle East. Worldwide, children grow up with a title they struggle to understand. The word refugee continues to segregate children from others. I will share the stories of Syrian refugees in Jordan, and I will focus on how our passive perspective needs to be changed, how we need to seriously consider integration across all contexts, and why I believe schools are the best place to start. Before I begin to talk about these findings, I want to admit that my perspective was only changed a few years ago. I was months away from finishing my undergraduate degree in computer science in Syria, when my life and the lives of everyone around me was completely transformed by a war we never saw coming. The normalcy and safety I had always known was replaced with a devastating but eye-opening journey. We would sleep and wake to the sounds and vibrations of bombs, to fear, to endless reminders of our mortality. And saying goodbyes to those who left us became a very normal part of our everyday experiences. And yet despite these hardships, I realized that I was fortunate. I still had a house and family that remained intact. It was, however, the feeling of devastation and loss that I felt for the millions of children in my country that I could not cope with. I felt helpless and I felt distant from streets only kilometers away, where unimaginable levels of violence, of hunger, 
and loss affected individuals whose fates were decided simply by the places they had inhabited. Prior to these events, and despite showing kindness to those displaced, I hadn't given much thought to whether our systems were doing right by those displaced. I resolved to understand why education could help children lead better lives. For over two years, I applied to universities in the hope that I would be able to pursue a new degree to help these children. Finally, I was accepted to study at Cambridge and I was granted a visa, a visa that allowed me to leave Syria, a concept which was nearly impossible for most Syrians. Today, I have discovered a new wealth of insights from researching the experiences of refugees. In 2017, I managed to gain access to four double shift schools in Jordan. I wanted to understand the experience of students and to talk to them. With this rare opportunity, I met 80 Syrian students who were between the ages of 13 to 16, and they had been in Jordan for years. Using the diaries I designed, I asked students to reflect on their lives, on their schools, on how they viewed their futures. Students reflected on one very important notion. They revealed to me that despite being able to be given the right to learn and given access to schools, many of them anticipated dropping out soon. And this was not because of the hardships and poverty they experienced only, but it was also because of their experiences within and around their schools. For them, schools are a chance to start over, to make friends, to learn again after missing out on years of education, to talk and laugh about ordinary things, and to think about a future despite the past they've seen. But I also learned this very important thing, that schools are places and points of contact between refugee and non-refugee communities, where the effects of issues like poverty, of social tensions, and of the negative attitudes presented in the media can transpire. Our attitudes shape the policies that affect the ways schools are structured, the curriculum we teach, and the values we encourage. The students I met talked about how they loved schools and learning. They talked about their teachers that they adored, teachers who believed in them. They talked about how the friends they met at school were like family to them. They talked about hobbies and about dreams of a different future. And they told tales of places and languages they imagined one day knowing. But with time, students also revealed to me that these stories they shared seemed like hopeful dreams. Their harsh realities tamed their aspirations. Every day, students talked about the discrimination and injustice they experienced within schools. They experienced discrimination by the teachers, teachers who had not received the training needed to respond to their needs. There's no hope in these Syrian refugee students is a sentence they often heard by their teachers. And around their schools, the classroom walls displayed drawings by students from the morning shift. Students from the evening shift were not allowed to go on schools or do activities like arts simply because of logistical and political limitations. Students wondered why, despite growing up in Jordan, they had yet to get to know a single Jordanian child. And these school structures and the segregation represent the reality of the fear that can divide communities. As morning shift students left their school hours to allow refugee students to attend theirs, parents and students from the morning shift would wait and harass and bully students. Coming to school for refugee students was no longer an act of learning, but also for dealing with theft, with harassment, and with the violence they were exposed to daily. Because of these experiences, students' visions of the futures was tamed. They wondered why they were learning in spaces that where they were segregated against and discriminated. And as a result, they felt that these experiences would mean they would never actually lead lives where they could be truly integrated, where they could find jobs and have freedom to be friends with anybody and to integrate. Students felt that they only knew worry and that they did not know childhood and innocence. And the effects of these experiences are truly alarming. Girls aged 14 told me of how the dreams to become successful women were now being replaced by marriage arrangements soon to take place. And how their parents had denied and rejected these ideas until sexual harassment, poverty, worry, and little hope for a better future had gotten to the best of their attitudes. The statistics behind these realities are also frightening and available. They show that completing secondary education for refugee students in countries like Jordan is extremely unlikely. Despite these hardships, students also showed at a certain point in time that they were very passionate about a future where they might be able to learn, to succeed, and to live lives of freedom. They portrayed one very important notion, that their vision for the future was defined by, by the attitudes of those around them. Students shared that had they been given the chance, 
they would like to consider Jordan, the place they had grown up in, as a new home. They would like to attach value and belonging to it. Students showed that what they truly wanted was to be visible. They wanted to be recognized for their contributions to science, to, humanis to humanities and philanthropy. And more than anything, students shared that they wanted to be given the right to dream, to hope, to be seen like any other individual with the same level of potential, the same level of hope. While many of these discussions painted a very painful and disconcerting picture, I also learned something that was truly remarkable and promising. That an opportunity to change the perspectives of communities, even the smallest one, would go a long way. I learned about positive exchanges between students and teachers that helped students reflect much more positively about their futures. I learned about how teachers would stay up in the evening trying to find ways to help these students experience an activity like a school trip or arts that they were not usually allowed to do due to logistical and political limitations, including budgets and scheduling. I learned about one very important program that tried to bring Jordanians and Syrians together for two hours every week. And through this program, the perspective of every Syrian child I met and Jordanians was changed. The program tried to encourage students to come together and work through arts and sports. And through this program, students got to know each other. Students said that the 30 minute window between the double shift was now replaced with positive exchanges. And instead of violence and harassment, students exchanged hellos and goodbyes and the beginning of friendships. The students took home these positive messages and they shared them with their parents, their neighbors, and their teachers. As a result, some refugee students actually said that they had new hope that maybe Jordan could be a place for them one day. I also learned through my time with students and through the end of the program when they shared letters with me that students wanted to have voice. Students gave me many letters expressing the hope and relief they felt from being able to share their stories. They said that nobody had asked them how they are in years. They said that being able to talk about their stories, to reflect and to have voice gave them a sense of visibility and sense that they had not actually felt in years. These simple, small, but powerful stories show how schools can be positive places where we can give hope to children, where we can bring in communities to live together, and we can change our perspectives. Perspectives that can transform the way children lead their lives. This challenge is not unique to the Middle East, to Jordan, or to Syrian refugees. Worldwide, millions of children continue to grow up in these spaces. We have accepted segregated camps, spaces, tightened border controls, and labels as our new norms. We have accepted social tensions. We have accepted that we can be divided. We continue to hope that refugee crises are temporary, and yet, every day, more people are displaced, and for longer. Every day, including today, more children are born into displacement or are displaced. There is more value to our perspective than we admit. We must begin to recognize that as individuals, our values and our attitudes shape the way individuals are able to lead their lives. Individuals who simply ask to be recognized and dignified. Today, I was able to share my stories with you and the, st the stories of Syrian refugee students. I stood here as a researcher, as a student, but also as a Syrian migrant. I have been given the support and opportunities needed to help me restudy, to move countries, to meet people from all over the world. I have been able to exchange enriching moments and conversations. And I hope that we allow these opportunities for children. I hope that we allow them to dream, to belong, to be believed in. I hope that we invest more into schools to try and inspire new perspectives, perspectives that help us live together. Let, our, let us be reminded that our perspectives do define these things. Our perspectives define whether we are allowed to connect and meet and be enriched by those we have not met yet. Let our perspectives be reminded of the words that a Syrian child said to me. I am a child just like any other. I am kind and I have a beautiful heart. I love everyone that thinks about us, even if we do not get to see them.